Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. Welcome to my class. This is lecture number 13. In this lecture, we will be discussing the three revenue settlements introduced by the British in different parts of the country. As you know, the land revenue was the main source of the English East India Company. The territorial revenue formed the main income that is the territorial revenue means the income from the land in the form of taxes which formed the main source of income of the British. The commercial revenue this was the revenue the British derived from trade and business which was only second the main source was land revenue. So, in order to extract as much revenue as possible, the British introduced three different types of land revenue settlements in India. One was the permanent land revenue system settlement. The second came in known as right wide system of settlement. And the third system of settlement came in known as Mahalwari system of settlements. All these system of settlements were introduced by the British to get as much revenue as possible since this territorial revenue or the income from land was the main source of the English East India Company. First of all, let us look at the permanent land revenue system of settlement. And Before the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement, we have to make a quick recap of the revenue settlements which had already been in existence in Bengal. During the period of Corn Valleys, this permanent land revenue system of settlement was introduced. Before the period of Lord Corn Valleys, Warren Hastings had introduced a five-year settlement popularly known as quinquennial settlement. After the failure of this quinquennial settlement, he introduced an annual settlement in Bengal. But these two settlements were ended in failure. Both these settlements were oppressive. And these Settlements also produced, introduced by Warren Hastings. The required raw materials for the British from Bengal, that is silk and cotton. So, he abolished this annual settlement introduced by Warren Hastings in Bengal and introduced the permanent land revenue system of settlement in 1793 in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. Why did Lord Cornwallis introduce this permanent land revenue system of settlement in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa? He himself expressed certain merits behind the introduction of this settlement in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. It would reduce the scope of corruption. Since the land tax was fixed, the revenue collectors could not make any change in the amount of tax to be paid by the peasants. Secondly, since the land tax was fixed, no change was made in the amount of tax 
later even if the peasants got surplus production lord cornwallis believed that the semi tards would invest the surplus production for the improvement of agriculture thirdly since the land tax was fixed permanently it would provide a permanent income to the british even during the period of natural calamities like a flood or drought but in other settlements the english east india company and the peasants were required to share the burden of the crop failure due to shortage of rainfall or the floods or droughts but in this case this crop failure did not affect the english east india company in any way even during the natural calamities the peasants were required to pay the fixed amount of tax these were the merits of the permanent land revenue system of settlement dr convalis had seen that is why he did introduce the system of permanent land revenue system of settlement in bengal bihar and orissa in 1793 with whom did lord convalis make this settlement as you have been told that it was a permanent land revenue the land tax was fixed permanently there was no change was made in the amount of tax to be paid by the peasants since lord convalis himself belonged to the landed aristocracy in britain he wanted to have a settlement with the semintars semintar the word originated from the persian semi means land dar means holder semindar which literally means the holder of land lord convalis wanted to have settlement with these semintars in britain these landlords used it to spend the surplus money for the improvement of the land likewise he hoped that the semindars in bengal bihar and orissa would invest the surplus money for the improvement of land and that is why lord convalis decided to make settlement with the semindars who were made the intermediaries between the british and the peasants for the collection of land tax and again it was difficult for the british to make a settlement with any other forces because there were 4 to 5 million cultivating families in these regions so it was difficult for the british to fix the amount of tax to be paid by each cultivating families it would tax several years and required large staff for preparing the amount of tax to be paid by each family of peasants to the british so it was easy for the british to collect land tax from a number of semintars under this system of settlement who became the owners of land the semintars became the owners of land the proprietorship or the ownership vested with them every bit of agricultural land in these regions of bengal bihar and orissa became the part of the semindari and semindars had to pay the tax after collecting tax from the peasants if the semindar was able to collect land tax from the peasants and pay to the british he would be the proprietor or the owner of the land but what would happen if he had failed to collect this land tax and pay to the british his semindari rights 
would be taken away. His zamindari rice would be taken away and sold it to the highest bidder. He could sell, sell mortgage and transfer the zamindari land to anybody. After his death, his successors used to inherit the zamindari land. As you have been told earlier, if the zamindars had failed to collect land tax from the peasants and pay with the British, his zamindari rice would be taken away by the British. He would lose ownership or the proprietorship of the land and after taking the lands from the zamindars, it would sold in public auction and it went to the hands of the highest bidder in the open action. And what about the condition of the peasants under the land revenue system of settlement introduced in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa? Earlier the peasants had enjoyed the ownership of land. Now the peasants lost ownership of land. They were reduced to the status of a mere tenant of the Semintars who enjoyed the right to evict the peasants at any point of time. They were the actual tillers of the soil. They did not enjoy ownership of the land. The ownership began to be given to the intermediary revenue collector Semintar. Convalis had instructed to issue a written document mentioning the amount to be paid by each peasant in the form of tax to the semintar. But none of these semintars issued written agreements to the peasants showing the amount they had to pay in the form of tax to these semintars. No agreements, no written agreements were issued by these semintars to the peasants showing the amount of tax to be paid by these peasants. Now the completely be, the now the peasants completely became at the mercy of the semintars who used it to collect more tax than prescribed by the British. Even though it was a permanent tax, the land tax was fixed high. It was an oppressive tax. According to Sir John Shore, he served as the Governor General after the period of Lord Cornwallis. He estimated that if a peasant had produced crop worth 100 rupees, 45 went to the government, 15 rupees to the semindar, and only 40 rupees was left with the actual cultivator. More money was collected by semindars. In addition to that, the peasants were required to give presents on festive occasions to the semintars. For the land tax was fixed very high, so it could be collected only through oppressive methods because the land tax was oppressive. These semintars used it to employ several oppressive methods for the collection of the land tax because if he the semindar failed to collect the land tax and pay to the British his semindari rights would be taken away. So oppressive methods began to be adopted by these semindars for collecting land tax from the peasants. By the regulations of 1793, 1799 and 1812 if the peasants had failed to pay the land tax to the semintar, 
Semindar was given the right to take away the property of the peasants. This was the right given by the regulations to the Semindars for attaching the property of the peasants. The Semindar was not required any permission from the court of law. This was the legal method of harassment given by the British to the Semindars. But in addition to this legal method, several illegal methods were also used by the Semindars for the collection of land tanks from the peasants, like locking up or beating the tenants. These were the legal illegal methods adopted by the Semindars if the peasants failed to pay land tax to the British. Thus, the permanent land revenue system of settlement made the life of the peasants miserable. The peasants lost ownership of the land. He was required to pay high amount of tax. If the land tax was not paid, paid his property would be taken away by the Semintar. So, this land revenue settlement made the life of the peasants miserable. In addition to this exploitation of the British by imposing high amount of land revenue and by the Semintars by exploiting the Semintars through various methods. These peasants were also exploited by another group. It was money lenders. Let us look how money lenders exploited the peasants. As you know, the land tax was fixed. There was no reduction was made even during natural calamities in the amount of tax to be paid by the peasants. So, during natural calamities like flood or excessive rainfall, or drugs, crop failed. But even during the crop failure, no reduction of land tax was made by the British. Even during this time, the peasants used to borrow money from the money lenders. These money lenders used to collect exorbitant or high interest rate from the peasants on the loans taken by this peasant from the money lenders. If the crop was good in the next year, he was in a position to re repay his fast debt. If again in the next year, the crop was failed due to bad monsoon or flood or excessive rainfall, he would not be in a position to repay his debt. He was likely to be fell into the debt trap which went for generations to generations. So in these ways the life of peasants became miserable. They were exploited by the British, Semintars and the money lenders. What impact did the permanent land revenue system of settlement make on the Semintars? From the above discussions, it is not presumed that the Semintars enjoyed absolute right. The Semintars were not given absolute right. They would enjoy the semi-indentary rights only such a time they collected money from the peasants and pay to the British. But if he failed to collect land tax from the peasants and pay to the British, his semi-indentary rights would be taken away by the British and sold it to the highest bidder in public auction. In Bengal alone, 68 percent of the Semindars lost their Semindari rights 
during the period between 1794-1819. Who were the new owners of land? From these dispossessed Semintars, merchants, government officials and other Semintars brought these lands. When the British sold these semindari lands in public auction. Now coming to Patni system, this was associated with this permanent land revenue system of settlement. Let us do look what Patni system was. Even after deploying these legal and illegal methods for the collection of this oppressive land tax, certain semindars failed. Even after deploying these machines to collect the land tax from the peasants. One such semindar was Taja of Burduan. He had failed to collect land tax from the peasants even after deploying the legal as well as the illegal methods following which he decided to divide his Semindari lands into a number of Patni Taluks, after which he gave these Patni Taluks to a holder they came to known as Patni Dar. Patni Dar was required to collect these tax and give it to the Semintar. If this Patnidar failed to collect the land tax from the persons and pay it to the Semintar, his Patni would be taken away and given to another person. Following the Raja of Burduan, other Semintars also followed this practice. And what was the result of this? It resulted in the development of self infudation like a pyramid. Now, the another system of settlement introduced by the British came into known as right wari system of settlement. Where did this right wari system of settlement the British introduce? The British introduced the right party system of settlement in Madras and Bombay presidencies. What were the features of the right party system of settlement? From the very nomenclature, right party, the owners of the land under the system of settlement was peasants, actual peasants enjoyed the ownership of land. But in the previous settlement which we have just discussed, that is permanent land revenue system settlement, the ownership of land was vested with the semintar. But under the right body system settlement introduced in Bombay and Madras presidencies, the ownership of land vested with this actual tillers of the soil, peasants. The land tax was collected directly from the peasants by the British officials. There was no intermediary like Semintars. It was one of the main feature of the right party system of settlement, ownership of land. In permanent land revenue system of settlement, ownership of land was vested with the Semintar, while in the right body system, it was vested with the actual tiller of the soil, the peasants. What were the other features? Each land was measured and then decided the amount of land tax based on the quality of the soil. After the measurement of the land and the quality of the soil, land tax was fixed. After which 
the peasants would be given the choice of cultivating this particular land or not. If the peasants was ready to cultivate and to pay the amount of tax fixed by the official, he could cultivate. If he was not ready to pay the fixed tax, he would be given the choice of not cultivating this land. And these government officials had to personally visit each plot of land for measuring as well as fixing the quality of the soil, whether it was rocky or barren or fertile land or not. Based on the quality of the soil, the land tax was fixed. And under this system, the land tax was to be fixed uniformly. If the land tax was not fixed uniformly, what would happen? Ah, the peasants would not take the heavily assessed lands. They would take only the lands having light amount of tax. As you have been told, the ownership was with the actual tiller of the soil. And while fixing the tax, two things the officer had to, the government officer had to keep in mind. One, the quality of the soil, whether it was rocky, rich, or irrigated, or barren, or dry land. Secondly, the survey of land. Land should be surveyed or measured. And after checking the quality of the soil, the land tax was fixed. The land tax was fixed uh, either as one third of the total produce or two fifths of this based on the quality of the soil. Now, coming to these were the theoretical aspects of the right party system of settlement. Now, we are going to see what did happen in practice. In theory, the Rajvaiji system of settlement was to be introduced only after the measurement of the land as well as checking the quality of the soil, land tax was fixed. After the fixation of this land tax, the peasants would be given the choice of cultivating this particular land or not. These were the theoretical aspects of the right value system of settlement. We are going to see what it happened in practice, first in Madras. In Madras, this right value system of settlement was introduced in 1820 by Colonel Munro. He argued certain merits behind the introduction of the right valley system of settlement in Madras. Like Lord Convalley had mentioned a certain merits behind the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. What merits did Colonel Munro see behind the introduction of the right valley system of settlement in Madras? His argument was that it was the original land revenue system in India, which had been in existence several years. This was the, the first argument made by Colonel Munro behind the introduction of the right body system of settlement in Madras. Secondly, he argued that it would create large amount of revenue to the Madras government since there were no semintars or intermediary who had taken away the part of the tax paid by the peasants. Now we recall 
the permanent land revenue system settlement where the zamindars took away 15% 15% of the tax collected by the zamindars went to them of the total production of the persons total production if the percent from the persons zamindars collected 100 15% went to the coffers of the zamindars but under the right wary system of settlement there was no leakage of money in between the british and the actual tiller whatever the amount collected directly went to the british one there was one more reason behind the introduction of the right wary system of settlement by the british in madras since madras government always faced a shortage of funds canal mandro argued that by introducing the right wary system of settlement in madras madras government would get adequate flow of funds from the peasants without any kind of leakage these were the arguments put forward by canal mandro began the introduction of the right wary system of settlement in madras in 18 1820 right wary system of settlement was extended in most of the parts of the madras presidency under the leadership of canal mandro as you recall now that the right wary system of settlement what it have been introduced only after the measurement of the land as well as checking the quality of the soil in theory but in practice it was extended to many districts where no survey had ever been carried out in theory this system of settlement what it have been introduced only after detailed measurement of land as well as checking the quality of the soil but in practice in madras most parts of the madras after 1820 the system of settlement got introduced in areas where no survey had already been done nobody was aware of about how much land a person cultivated there was no details or accounts regarding this now the land tax was fixed based on an arbitrary basis not based on in practice not based on the quality of the soil or after the measurement of the land the land tax began to be fixed based on the amount which they had paid earlier this came in known as put cut system the land tax was fixed based on their payment in previous years the system of land tax fixation came in known as put cut system again in theory we have seen that after the fixation of the land tax to be paid on this particular land the persons were given the choice to cultivate or not to cultivate most of the time heavily assessed lands were not taken away by the persons for cultivation because they were required to pay high amount of tax but if the choice was freely given what would happen the state revenue would fall the heavily assessed lands would be taken over by the persons for cultivation so 
the government officers were required to force to cultivate the land even if they were not interested because of the high amount of tax fixed by these government officials thus the cultivation was not voluntary most of the time the peasants were compelled to cultivate the lands which actually they were not interested to cultivate but because of the force of the government officials the peasants were required to cultivate so the cultivation was not voluntary the collection of land tax was also rendered difficult it was because of the high assessment of land tax these cultivators did not take up this land for cultivation so it rendered the british to difficulty to collect this high amount of land tax from the peasants so in madras also beating and torturing of the peasants were started for the collection of this high amount of tax we have seen that in permanent land revenue system of settlement areas also both illegal and legal methods were used by the zamindars for the collection of land tax likewise in madras beating and torturing of the peasants were used by the revenue collectors the madras torture commission which was appointed by the government of madras to enquire into these illegal methods used by the revenue collectors against the peasants in the report of the madras torture commission it was clearly mentioned these illegal methods which had been used by the revenue collectors to realize the tax amount from the peasants but only after the report of the madras torture commission scientific surveys began in madras the measurement of the land and checking the quality of the soil and the fixation of land tax based on this began in madras only in 1850s after which the condition of the peasants slowly emerged good what were the effects of the right by the system of settlement in madras no doubt since in most of the assessed lands the land tax was fixed heavily and oppressive it impoverished the persons and they lacked the resources for starting agriculture in the next year they did not uh, leave with the required money for the purchase of seeds agricultural tools and implements so they were impoverished in 1855 it became clear to the government that only 14.5 million acres of land were cultivated in madras in 1855 while 18 million acres of land remained uncultivated in madras in 1855 the land lost saleable value there were no buyers of land buying the buying the lands imposed heavy burden on the buyers 
he was required by la by purchasing the land he was required to pay high amount of tax and after purchasing this land the new owner was unlikely to get any income from the purchase of new land because all the money was to be given as tax to the british now coming to right wide system of settlement introduced in bombay as you know through the anglo maratha war of 1815 1818 the british was able to defeat the confederacy of maratha chiefs and the territories of the marathas came under the control of the british and in these areas right wide system of settlement was introduced under the disciple of colonel mandro elfiston in madras colonel mandro was the brain behind the introduction of the right wide system settlement while in bombay presidency it was elfiston who played a key role behind the introduction of the right wide system of settlement in bombay presidency once this right wide system settlement introduced in bombay presidency the abuses of madras appeared in bombay presidency as well we have seen how theoretically and in practice the right wide system settlement worked in madras presidency the evil effects of this right wide system settlement also appeared in bombay presidency once it was introduced in areas which had earlier been occupied by the marathas the measurement and the classification of land as you know theoretically the land tax was fixed in a right wide system settlement after the detailed survey as well as taking the quality of the soil in bombay presidency this land measurement and the fixation of land tax after taking the quality of the soil was done by pringle his theory was based on the rent theory developed by english economist david ricardo but this theory of rent developed by david ricardo was not applicable in indian conditions however pringle used this theory of rent developed by english economist david ricardo and based on which this theory he calculated the land tax in right wide areas in bombay presidency now the revenue collected is spent to collect the land tax from the persons based on the calculations made by pringle the pringle's calculations was an oppressive tax many of the cultivators gave up their land once these revenue officials sent it to collect land tax from the persons directly they escaped from the bombay presidency to the territory of the nizam of hyderabad because of this oppressive taxation but wingate and goldsmith the two other officers they were appointed after pringle's calculations ended in failure wingate and goldsmith 
reformed the land revenue system, they did not apply any theoretical rules, instead of which they reduced the amount of tax to be paid by the peasants to the British. Now, the effects of the right value system of settlement in these two presidencies taken together. In most of the time, the option or the choice were not used despite the interest of the cultivator, he was forced to cultivate the land. Most of these lands were highly carried highly fixed taxes. In addition to that, in most of the places in Madras, even non-cultivating landlords ended their names as actual tiller. Even though in document he was ended as a tiller, but in practice he was not a cultivator or a tiller. Actual cultivation of the land was carried out by his tenants or bonded labor rights. It was the case, particularly in irrigated districts of Tanjaur, where many landlords got lands by stating that they were actual tillers or the cultivator, but they distributed this land among the tenants or the bonded laborers who actually carried out the cultivation. In Tanjaur, many of the rights, they were actually not the rights, the landlords held thousands of acres of land. One drawback of the right value system of settlement was that no limit to the amount of land a right could hold. It was possible for the right to hold thousands of acres of land because difference in wealth between one right and with the other right. These landlords holding thousands of acres of land for cultivation got huge wealth. They were wealthy landlords. While there were other cultivators who were very poor and found it difficult to pay tax to the British. The life between this wealthy landlord and the right was different. A reformed system of settlement was introduced in Bombay in 1836 and in 1858 in Madras. After the introduction of these reforms, the one of the main characteristics of this reform was that the amount of land tax to be paid by the peasants got reduced. With the reduction of the amount of land tax, the peasants got some relief from these oppressive taxation systems. Now, the third land revenue system of settlement introduced by the British in India was Mahalwari system. Now, you recall that it was during the period of the Lord Wellesley by adopting the system of subsidiary alliance brought many dominions under the control of the British in North India. In 1801, by imposing subsidiary alliance, the Nawab of Auth was required to surrender half of his territories. These territories surrendered by Nawab of Auth came to known as ceded territories. Then, after the Anglo-Maratha War, 
of 1818. In this war of 1818, the British completely defeated the Marathas in the Third Anglo-Maratha War. After which the British got territories between Ganga and Yamuna. These territories came into known as conquered territories. These territories the British got from the out came into known as ceded territories. In addition to that, the Lord Hastings, he also brought under the British control many territories in North India. And in these territories, the Magalwari system of settlement was introduced. This system was developed by Holt McKinsey. Holt McKinsey in 1819. Based on this theory developed by Holt McKinsey, the settlement was introduced in the conquered and the ceded territories of the British in Ganga Valley, in Northwest Provinces, Central India, and a modified form of this Magalwari system was introduced in Punjab. No doubt. The Magalwari system of settlement was a modified version of the settlement which Lord Cornwallis had introduced in Bengal. Under the Magalwari system of settlement introduced in these areas, the land in each village or Mahal, that is why it came in known as Magalwari system. Mahal means village. The village was jointly owned by the village community. And then the village or the Mahal was made responsible for the payment of land tax. That is why the system of land tax came into known as Mahalwari system of settlement. The Mahal was either a single village and some other times it was a group of villages. The village Hetman was made responsible for the collection as well as the payment of land tax to the British under the Mahalwari system of settlement. The headman was responsible for the payment of land tax. The village headman used to divide this land among his villagers and they were required to introduce cultivation and then he collected the land revenue from the villagers and paid it to the British. In addition to that, Individual persons also enjoyed ownership of the land in these areas. Initially, the land tax was fixed 80% of the rental value of the land. It was a highly oppressive land tax. But in 1833, it was modified. Walter McKinsey's calculation was 80% of the rental value of the land, but it was reduced in 1833 to 66% of the rental value of the land. Under Martin's Birch, under his charge, these calculations were made during the period of William Bendick as the Governor General. And this fixed settlement was made for 30 years. But even after the reduction to 66%, the peasants were not in a pay, they, the peasants were not in a position to pay this tax. 
following which large portions of land were sold by the peasants to these money lenders and the merchants so the original cultivators lost their land and they became mere tenants of these landlords or semintards in 1855 it was during the period of lord dalhousy the payment of tax was again reduced to 50% of the rental value of the land these were the characteristic features of this land settlement introduced by the british in different parts of the country now the major questions what were the effects of the permanent land revenue system settlement what were the features of the magalwari system settlement evaluate the functioning of the rightwari system settlement in bombay and madras presidencies thank you students for watching my class thank you understanding oneself understanding others understanding society at large understanding the nature these are all driven by basic human curiosity we would all love to understand why things happen what happens what is the final outcome why certain things fail these are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge therefore knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts they have to be rooted into historical perspective they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio political reasons behind this whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences whether you talk with respect to physical sciences biological sciences social sciences that's the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us the knowledge that is segregated that is divided with respect to areas specializations all of them needs to be understood in its context and what provides the context it is the social reality how do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality with the social reality with the socio political compulsions okay how do you understand the law of nature okay in its totality and for doing that you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences say for instance if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria a virus any microbe how it affects behavior how it affects the organism human being you start looking at it from a pure biological point of view if you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength say for example you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life you are looking at things from a physical point of view you are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body you are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information you are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process why still human beings engage into it you are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view why society at large admire things which has full of risk you are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences you are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view so there are whole lot of things and then finally you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life then you say you are looking at life you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view and this is what social sciences courses provide you they provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning 
the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain. It could be engineering, it could be sciences, it could be medical sciences, it could be, it could be humanities stuff. So, con contextualizing the social science courses help you obtain. 